Hi, Ninja Nerds. So in this video, we're going to talk about the antibiotics that are specifically attacking uh, protein synthesis. So we've already gone over in our previous videos antibiotics that are treating cell wall, so specifically targeting cell wall synthesis and function. We also talked about the antibiotics in another video that are targeting the actual folic acid pathway. All right, so now we're going to talk about the antibiotics that are targeting protein synthesis. Before we do that, Right here we have a ribosome, right? Now the ribosomes within prokaryotic cells or bacterial cells specifically are actually made up of two different subunits really. So you have what's called a 50S, which is this, this large ribosomal subunit. And then down here you have what's called a 30S ribosomal subunit. So two subunits. 50S is the large ribosomal subunit and then the 30S is the small ribosomal subunit, okay? And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because certain drugs attack the 50S rather than the 30S. Okay, so the first ones that we're going to talk about here, let's actually first off start specifically looking at the antibiotics that are uh, targeting the 50S. So let's look at the uh, macrolides. So let's take a look at the macrolides. So macrolides. So macrolides are specifically, if I were to give specific examples of macrolides, um, this would be like erythromycin, so erythro mycin, this could be like a, a zithromycin, so a zithromycin, and even clarithromycin. So I could even say another one, which is actually going to be clarithromycin, right? So I got a zithromycin, clarithromycin, a zithromycin. These are actually going to be antibiotics here. And what are these guys specifically doing? These are very, very interesting. So what they do is they attack the 50S ribosomal subunit. How do they do that? Okay, so you know what happens is the tRNA will come in, so you have the different parts of the ribosome. You have the A site, you have the P site, and then you have the E site. What happens is these macrolides, they actually come over here, and what they do is, as the ribosome is actually, it moves across the mRNA, right? So this is right here is the mRNA. So what it does is the ribosome actually moves along the mRNA and synthesizes the protein. What these macrolides do is, is they inhibit the ribosome from actually moving and elongating the actual peptide chain. So they inhibit from reading or moving along the mRNA. If they inhibit it from moving along the mRNA, then what's it going to do? It's not going to be able to synthesize a functional protein. If it can't synthesize a functional protein, then what? This actually could actually cause a lot of different problems. It's not bactericidal, it's bacteriostatic. So, and bacteriostatic meaning it actually inhibits specific types of cellular functions that doesn't result, it doesn't actually cause the cell to die, but inhibits certain pathways from functioning, right? So specifically, these macrolides are bacteriostatic. So clarithromycin, erythromycin, azithromycin, and again, what are they doing? They're preventing the ribosome from moving along the mRNA and translating the actual mRNA to proteins. Okay, so you know macrolides are really good at being able to treat uh, pneumonia, usually. So they can treat, treat pneumonia. Um, so specifically, so if they treat pneumonia, the certain types of bacteria that they're targeting that cause pneumonia, specifically here, could be like the uh, Legionella. So Legionella, okay, or even the Mycoplasma, so even Mycoplasma that cause pneumonia. So it's targeting these certain types of bacteria. Okay? All right, so another different one that it can actually treat is also specifically H. pylori. So H. pylori, you know, is specifically good at being able to uh, treat uh, usually different specific types of uh, infections, specifically the peptic ulcer. So whenever you have the peptic ulcer, it can cause infections. So you can actually use this to treat H. pylori. Okay? So it's good at being able to treat H. pylori. It's also good for being able to treat certain types of gastrointestinal tract infections, right? So certain types of GI infections. What types of GI infections? GI infections that are caused by the Campylobacter. Okay, so let's write this down. So what other types of infections? GI tract infections, right? And what type of bacteria specifically? Specifically targeting the Campylo, Campylobacter. Okay, so specifically the Campylobacter. Okay, what else? This guy can do a lot. So he, you know, he can also be used to treat uh, 
Um, you know, it's also really good at being able to treat specific types of sexually transmitted diseases too. So sexually transmitted diseases. So what types of uh, sexually transmitted diseases can this guy treat? He's also good at being able to treat specifically uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea. So chlamydia and gonorrhea. All right, so again, let's go over macrolides one more time. So what are macrolides doing? Macrolides, and then what are the types there? You have azithromycin, you have clarithromycin, you have erythromycin. These are gonna be able to treat gram positive and gram negative. Clarithromycin is a little bit better for the gram negative coverage. But what are they doing? And their mechanism of action is they inhibit the ribosome from actually moving along the mRNA. So they prevent the actual elongation of the peptide chain, right? So they prevent that from happening. How, what kind of bacteria they can, can they treat? They can treat pneumonia, which can be caused by lesionella or mycoplasma. They can treat H. pylori, which is one of the common causes of the specific types of peptic ulcers, right, that can become infected. They can also treat GI tract infections caused by the campylobacter. And they can treat sexually transmitted diseases like chlamydia and even gonorrhea. Okay, so this is our macrolides. Now let's move over and look at the other guy that can target the 50S subunit. This guy's here are actually going to be called your amino glycosides. So these are going to be your amino glycosides. So what are some of the amino glycosides? So you could have what's called gentamice, gentamicin, gentamicin. Uh, you could have what's called tobramycin. And there's other different types of amino glycosides that you could use. But again, these are just a couple. I'm not going to mention all of them, but gentamicin, tobramycin, these are amino glycosides. Now, amino glycosides are pretty cool. What can these amino glycosides actually do? So amino glycosides are really good at being able to specifically, so they target the 50S subunit. How do they target the 50S subunit? Okay, so let's say that we have, you see this guy right here? This is called a tRNA, so our transfer RNA, right? So this is our T. RNA. So a tRNA is carrying specifically the anticodons complementary to the codons within the mRNA. And then they're carrying a specific amino acid that's specific to those codons. Now, when this guy is coming into the A site, guess what these amino glycosides do? They come in and they block the frick out of this guy. He's like, no way. You're not getting into this site. So it blocks the tRNA from being able to come into the A site. If it blocks the tRNA from being able to come into the A site, can you be able to make a functional proteins out of that? No. So it's blocking this tRNA, which is carrying the amino acids, the building blocks for proteins. If you inhibit the tRNA from coming in here and then allowing for this protein to be elongated and made, then you're not going to be able to allow for this bacteria to survive eventually, right? So again, this tRNA is actually being inhibited from binding here in the A site by amino glycosides like gentamicin and tobramycin. Now, amino glycosides are weird because these are actually bactericidal, whereas the mac macrolides are bacteriostatic. So these actually cause cell death directly. These ones do not, okay? They can actually eventually cause the cell to die, but their main effect is actually bacteriostatic in effect, which is kind of a, a complicated topic. All right, so what do amino glycosides do? They treat mainly gram negative, but they have gram positive and gram negative coverage. So they're mainly treating um, gram negative, like pseudomonas, so like, like pseudomonas, um, other different types of gram negative, like aerobic gram negative bacteria. So certain types of aerobic gram negative bacteria. And they're also good at being able to treat specifically the enterobacteria. So gram negative enterobacteria, okay? So what kind of things could they actually treat? Um, you can actually use amino glycosides to treat specifically. Um, these are actually good at being able to treat uh, usually four different things here. So what are these four things here? One is it's actually used to be able to treat specifically urinary tract infections. So it's actually good at being able to treat urinary tract infections. It's also good at being able to treat pneumonia. Okay. And it's also good at being able to treat meningitis. Okay, as well as peritonitis. Okay, peritonitis. You know, peritonitis is an inflammation of the peritoneum within inside of the actual gastrointestinal tract. So again, it can treat 
urinary tract infections, pneumonia, meningitis, peritonitis, and what type of bacteria is it targeting? Uh, Pseudomonas, uh, aerobic gram-negative bacteria, as well as certain types of enterobacteria. Okay, so that's our aminoglycosides. And what is it doing? It's inhibiting the tRNA from binding into the A site. Okay. All right, so the last one that we're going to talk about here that's targeting this protein synthesis pathway, pathway is tetracyclines. So specifically, what kind of would we use here? We could actually go over uh, tetracycline, so certain types of tetracycline antibiotics. Uh, so for example, uh, doxycycline. So doxycycline is a really good one. So doxycycline. And tetracycline and doxycycline can treat a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that they can also, they can actually treat, um, they, they actually have the ability to treat specifically Lyme's disease. They've actually been good at treating Lyme's disease lately. So that's one thing. They're actually good at treating Lyme's disease. So you know what Lyme's disease is? That's actually caused by the uh, Borrelia burgdorferi protein. You know, the tick bites, whenever the ticks actually bite, they, they actually inject in the Borrelia burgdorferi protein, which causes a lot of problems, like joint pain and even nervous system problems as well. Right? So they're also good at being able to treat chlamydia. So chlamydia, you know, is actually one of the uh, sexually transmitted diseases and actually can cause respiratory tract infections as well. So Lyme's disease, chlamydia, um, it's also good at being able to treat other different types of, you know, it can actually treat acne too. They actually give it to people who have acne. So they actually use it for acne. Um, acne and rosacea. So acne and rosacea. They also, interestingly, use it, uh, you know, back in the day, they used to have what's called the bubonic plague. Um, it's actually caused by a specific type of uh, pathogen called Yersinia, uh, Yersinia pestis. It actually caused the bubonic plague. This is some hardcore stuff, right? So it caused the bubonic plague. They actually can use tetracycline and doxycycline to be able to kill. Uh, certain types of bacteria like the Yersinia uh, pestis, which can cause the bubonic plague, as well as, some of you might have heard of this, anthrax. So it can also be used to treat anthrax. Oh, and you know it also is good at being able to treat pneumonia. So pneumonia too. Uh, pneumonia caused by uh, Legionella. So it's also good at being able to treat pneumonia caused by the Legionella bacteria. Okay, so which is a gram-negative gram bacteria. So it's also good at being able to treat Legionella-induced pneumonia. So tetracycline, again, one more time, what does it do? He has the similar effect to the aminoglycosides, except he's targeting it here at the actual 30S ribosomal subunit. So aminoglycosides are targeting the 50S. So are macrolides. But the tetracycline and the doxycycline is inhibiting the 30S ribosomal subunit. How? Same thing, but instead of it binding here in the 50S ribosomal subunit, he comes in and binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit and prevents, again, prevents the tRNA from coming into the A site and allowing for it to read these codons in the mRNA. So if this does not happen, the proteins aren't going to be completely synthesized correctly. And tetracycline and doxycycline is a bacteriostatic antibiotic, okay? All right, engineers, so in this video, we talked about the antibiotics that are used to treat uh, bacterial infections, right? But specifically them targeting the protein synthesis pathway. In the next video, we'll talk about the antibiotics that are going to be affecting the DNA and RNA synthesis.